if you take it at face value, you're going to say, oh, this guy is writing an expose on faith. No, these are political historical thrillers. And I've had both books um, looked at by uh, Muslim colleagues who, who would, would flag for anything controversial. They, but they come back and say, wow, you've taught me some things about my own faith that I didn't know. Hi friends, this is Read and Write with Natasha podcast. My name is Natasha Tynes and I'm an author and a journalist. In this channel, I talk about the writing life, review books and interview authors. Hope you enjoy the journey. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. Today I'm very happy to have with me author Ethan Borough, who's an award-winning a writer and author who dedicated much of the last two decades of his life exploring the Middle East and unraveling its mysteries. His Clayton Haley Reveal series tracks the exploration of uh, a foreign service officer into modern and ancient Middle Eastern mysteries. Here is uh, the book that I just finished. It's called uh, me, uh, messianic reveal and it is part of his series so ethan so happy to have you with us uh and welcome to uh my humble podcast and so ethan uh i really enjoyed uh your book uh i finished it very quickly and as someone from the Middle East, uh, I, you know, I, I could relate to it. I understood, mo- you know, all the terminologies. So can you tell us a bit about the book and what inspired you to write this book and the whole series in general? Well, thank you, Natasha. Uh, Natasha, and I should start by saying, Ahlan Fiki, Gatiki Alapia. It's very nice to meet you. Very nice to see you. Um, and certainly, I'm delighted to be with you uh, on your podcast, Read and Write with Natasha. Um, and I, I just have to say, I so much enjoyed meeting you. I think it was in Gaithersburg, Maryland. I think I was doing a book yes. signing and you were there and, yes. and you were very kind to let me dust off my very rusty Arabic and, and you were very patient. <laughs> I, I have to say that was such a wonderful experience for me just, just to meet you there and, and get to use a little bit of Arabic. Um, so, um, and, and I, I have listened to a, a few of your uh, podcasts and I have to just commend you on how interesting and relevant they are. And, and I like the variety that you that you present from influencers to publishers to writers. It's just a wonderful show. So I, I, I proudly commend you and, and uh, congratulate you on, on your podcast. And yes, Messianic Reveal. I love to see people's reaction to the title. The title is perfectly matched to the book, but it's not what folks think at all. I think you'll agree with me. And I want to be very clear up front. This is historical fiction. It's historical and political fiction. And it's based on a series of real events. There is a religious component, and here it is right here, a messianic component, but it's not what people think. And, and just to answer your question, you know, how did I get started on this? Well, I didn't, I did not start out to write a novel. Mm-hmm. I simply began chronicling personal accounts and experiences and expertise and interviews that I've had with uh, probably hundreds of folks that I met while, while living in the Middle East over the last 25 years. Now, I've lived in or traveled extensively to Saudi Arabia, to Iraq, Kuwait, Jordan, Tunisia, Israel, the Palestinian territories, Syria, I think uh, maybe a few other places. I love it there. And I found living in the Arab world a fascinating experience. And I wanted to build a, kind of my own personal understanding of the region that, you know, this is the region that gave the United States, you know, largely our faith or faith, plural, and enlightenment. Um, and, and, and in which we had expended, and it's also a region in which we had expended so much political capital and in recent years, blood and treasure. So I wanted to know more about it, and I want to know more about the connection between our, you know, the politics of the United States or the policies of the United States and the people. So I tell the story, as you mentioned, uh, I tell the story uh, through the experiences of a rather unassuming and unexceptional foreign service officer or diplomat named Clayton Haley. And I wanted to take a fresh look at, you know, kind of um, a protagonist. And, and, and I, I want to steer clear of the uber spy guy or the uber soldier model. And, and I chose instead someone with two distinctive characteristics. You know, a diplomat, a young diplomat who has imposter syndrome, who just does not think he's worthy to, to be able to 
carry the, the, the might of the United States uh, di uh, diplomatic policies, and also someone with a great deal of intellectual curiosity. He's an army vet, and that's important to the story, but he's deeply empathetic to the people in the Middle East and sincerely wants to understand, uh, as I mentioned before, the impact of U.S. policy on the lives of the people there. And so the more I started just kind of collecting information and, and pulling together kind of anecdotes and, and thoughts and experiences, the more a narrative just appeared in front of me. And let me ask you a question, Natasha, before reading Messianic Reveal. I think I know the answer that you'll give yeah. me, but had you ever heard the name Muhammad Abdullah al Qahtani? No, no. And I haven't heard okay, of uh, the events related to him either. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that because of so many smart people like you, and I think like me, had never heard the name Muhammad Abdullah al Qahtani or Jahayman al Otaibi or Mehrus bin Laden, but these, these are really important people. And, and I'm just a little bit of a spoiler here, the messianic part, you can see the eyes, the honey-tinged eyes here yeah. uh, on the cover. Messianic Reveal is the true, it's about a series of true events surrounding a messianic cult takeover of Mecca. Again, a lot of very smart people know nothing about this. A lot of people who follow history. Now, and I, I love history. Uh, history is kind of a passion project for me. And, and if you ask me or any other, you know, I think student of history, what the big events over the last hundred years or so in the Middle East are, you know, they'll talk about the end of the Ottoman era and how that left a vacuum. Uh, they'll talk about, you know, how that also kind of sparked um, a desire for an Israeli home, homeland for the Jewish people. And then, you know, they'll talk about 1948, the establishment of the State of Israel, which was something the U.S. Uh, proudly supported. But on the flip side, for pe people from your part of the world, you know, in the greater Levant area, um, you know, they saw, that, many of them saw that as, as a negative. You know, they, in fact, they even called 1948 the, the Nekba, the, the, the great uh, catastrophe. 1967, you know, you had the Six-Day War, which I think from a Palestinian point of view, they call it the Nexa, the, the Calamity. Um, 1972, the Munich uh, Olympics with the, the murder of Israeli uh, athletes. 1973, Yom Kippur War. People know these, these kind of dates roughly. Uh, up until 1979, you had the, the um, ransacking of our embassy, the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, and the, the establishment or the return of Ayatollah Khomeini to uh, Tehran and the establishment of the, what is the Iranian Islamic Republic. 444-day hostage ordeal of U.S. Um, diplomats and, and, and uh, spies uh, in Tehran, and then 1980 to 1988, Iran-Iraq war, and you know the Iraq invasion of Kuwait in 1990, 1991, the liberation of Kuwait, all the way up to 9/11. You know these are dates that most people are familiar with, but for for the life of me, I couldn't figure out when I learned about this how no one knew about. I think one of the most signature and key events was. In 1979, and I just glossed over it as I just recounted all of my historical chron uh, chronology. In 1979, a guy by the name of Muhammad Abdullah al Qahtani, a Saudi national, led a messianic cult into the takeover of the Grand Mosque in Mecca. And the Grand Mosque is the, 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 the centerpiece, or, or the centerpiece of the Grand Mosque is the Kaaba, which is the, the house that many Muslims believe that Abraham and his son Ishmael built. And these guys held it for like two weeks. And it took the Saudi National Guard with uh, help from Pakistani commandos and French commandos who had to be hastily converted to Islam because no non-Muslim can set foot on the holy ground of Mecca. They, they went in and they routed these guys out, but the, at the cost of somewhere between 500 and 1,500 dead, dead people. I mean, there, there, there was uh, sniper fire, chemical warfare. There was... Um, uh, you know, grenades, uh, you know, machine gun fire. This was a really bloody melee in the holiest site of, of Islam, which is, you know, this is the very point that one and a half billion people prostrate themselves and pray toward every day, five times a day, and no one seems to know anything about this. Now, mm -hmm. after this major ordeal, um, you know, they, they routed, you know, they, they were able to, you know, expel all the, the militants. Um, and they went out, they took them out to nine different cities across Saudi Arabia, cut off their heads, and, and then swept all of this under the magic carpet and were done with it. To me, uh, you know, this happened in my lifetime. I'm not sure if it happened in your lifetime, but it happened in my lifetime. 
And it's 1979. This is not ancient history. If it happened in the Vatican, we would know all about it. And it happened in Saudi Arabia, and we just don't know much about it. So it led me to ask a number of questions. Okay, could this have been connected to other events that were going on at the same time? So this is, you know, 1979. Well, two weeks prior to this, Ayatollah Khomeini goes up in uh, Tehran and, and has his Islamic uh, revolution there. About four or five weeks later, you have the start of the Iran-Iraq war. Could all of these be connected? Well, poor Clayton Haley, he, <laughs> he, he finds out. <laughs> and I think you found out too, right, Natasha? I think you found out maybe they could be connected, right? Yeah. So, I mean, this is really fascinating. And I said, actually, I was around three years old when, when this happened. So now, you, so now you know my age. But and everyone who's listening will know my age. But for me, I think the reason, like, I've, I've never heard about it. I lived in the Middle East, uh, you know, until, you know, my late 20s. Uh, I went to, you know, Arabic schools. You studied Arabic history. And, you know, we, we never heard about it. I, I think... We would understand why uh, they never taught this in school. It's a very uh, sensitive topic, culturally, religiously, politically. So, um, and you know, the Middle East is not known for its transparency in general. Uh, so, I'm not surprised we we never heard about it. Although, if like I started doing some research on you know Google and find you know few books here and there there's a wikipedia entry as well about it uh you know just just wanted to make sure that actually this happened you know what it was to do by due diligence and i even asked an older iraqi gentleman uh and he 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 said that he he knows about it uh he's probably in his almost he's, he's almost 70 so based on that you know the book can be seen as a bit controversial, uh, not probably in the U.S. I mean, in the U.S., it's just, you know, n- nobody cares because, you know, they see the Middle East as this crazy place or whatever. But I think among uh, people who are from the region or maybe Arab diplomats or Saudi diplomats. So I'm curious if uh, what was the reaction you got to this book, either by people of Middle Eastern Arab origin by diplomats, do they know about the book? What was the feedback that you got, you know, about this kind of controversial topic? The topic itself is notionally controversial. Uh, And honestly, I struggled with this. Like, you know, and I mean, I'm not looking to agitate. I'm not looking to provoke. I'm looking to kind of recount my own experiences dealing with people. And I find, and I found, you know, like I actually had a, a little bit of an altercation in when I was in Saudi Arabia with the Motawa, you know, and he's you mm. know the religious police, and uh, yeah. you know, I got into a long conversation, uh, an argument, a debate, and we did this over coffee at Starbucks because okay, I actually have you know uh, you know I write a character with intellectual curiosity because I have some curiosity. These are so to me, I did not want to look at this as good versus wrong or or good versus evil. This is. Uh, you know, in the Middle East and and in the United States, I'm not a hypocrite about this. I say, you know, you know, there is a mix of religion and politics, and you cannot sidestep it. If you do, you're min- you're missing a whole dimension of yeah. what motivates people. Religious religion or beliefs or faith um, is a strong motivating factor for people. And when I get into the political world, and this is not a religious book. It is not at yeah. all. It's a political book. Um, but I dare not, re, you know, eliminate uh, a whole component because then I take out a whole dimension. So to answer your question, how do people respond? Um, I've had some Muslim friends who've read my book uh, and uh, they said, wow, um, you've taught me so much about my own faith. And it's like, mm. this is not a religious book. You know, please, I'm going to say it over and over and over. This is a political thriller. This is something you will enjoy watching on Netflix one day um, mm-hmm. if it gets past some of the controversy. But the thing is, I do dare, because I know the people there, I do dare to talk about the very friction points between religion and politics. I'm not looking to say this faith is right, this faith is wrong. I'm saying that the, the faith of people on a regular basis does get exploited by spoilers, by 
manipulators, by the power elite, people who want to have political gain at the expense of, of, of the belief system of a lot of wonderful people. Um, and, and that is one of the underlying truths in, in this book, that uh, the faith of a lot of good people does get exploited you know, for the power elite. And I don't attack a particular government. I, don't, I certainly don't attack uh, the, you know, a religion or faith, but I do point out how these, these beliefs do get distorted from time to time. Mm. Fascinating. So um, I'm glad to see that, you know, uh, some of the Arabs and Muslim friends really liked the book and, and mm. uh, enjoyed it. And I, I also, you know, learned a lot about my own culture um, uh, in, you know, and my the place where I grew up. And uh, what was the negative feedback that you got, if you've got that. Abby. So as, as an author, we always get to negative feedback, regardless of <laughs> what topic, you know, I always get yelled at, so that that's fine. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just <laughs> curious. What was, what was, if, if you were comfortable sharing it? Well, you asked the question, so I have to answer it. So, <laughs> so I, You can I, say I, no I, comment. <laughs> it's fine. It's, it's a free country. No, <laughs> no um, uh, I think, um, the comment, frankly, I had two, two comments. One is, you know, they, they, people have tried to read it and it's short. You can see it's, it's you know, yeah. it should only take you a couple hours. You read it in a few hours and you read it because you were familiar with a lot of the material and it was Correct. easier to read for you than it would be for someone who knew nothing about the Middle East. Uh, now I wrote it for, honestly, I, I, you know, I have many audiences in mind, uh, including, People, you know, devout Christians who want to understand why all these bad things happen in the Middle East, but also Muslims who want to understand how, you know, we perceive things, you know, we in the West perceive things in the Middle East, but also for our, mili- our soldiers. You know, there's a, there's a military component. Um, uh, you know, our, uh, our protagonist is a, an army vet himself, which, uh, I think is very key to the story. But so the negative, I, I, feedback is, <laughs> frankly, it's like, you know, Ethan, you use way too many Arab names in your book. Mm. It's too hard to follow. And and of course, my response is, I can't. Okay, the the main villain here is a guy named Mohammed Abdullah Kastani. I can't change his name to Chuck or Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do that. That doesn't work. Yeah. You know, yeah. he has to be from the Al Kastan tribe. He has yeah. to have re- religious credential. He has to have you know connections that go back that. So if someone from a tribe on the Arabian Peninsula reads this, they have to know that I just didn't pull things out of out of thin air, that I did my research. Um, and that research makes this a little bit dense and hard to read. And other people, and this is something I actually, and you you said, you you checked me out. You fact-checked me. And I yeah. love that. I love that because I did a lot of incredulity. People like, they start reading. And I have a, you know, a neighbor who the other day is like, uh, well, a couple months ago said, when I was reading your book, I had to keep stopping to go and fact check you. Yeah. I said, bring it on. I love it. I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm introducing things that people have never considered, never heard, never thought um, about some events that they are somewhat familiar with. Yeah. Now, Natasha, do you mind? Can I make a plug for my second book, which just came out? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, go ahead. This, Writ reveal because you did say it is a Clayton Haley reveal series. Series, yeah, yes, yeah, a series, and this is part two. Uh, part three is uh, going to publish sometime soon, probably over the next year. Part four, I'm nearly finished, but um, so you have uh, messianic reveal, and then writ reveal, and then you have Babylon reveal, and then pro- uh, prophecy reveal. So the reveal series, but this one, this is the second one, just came out. I'm so proud of this, and yes, more controversy, um, <laughs> more intrigue. Now, you can't see this very well, but this... Let me put my glasses, yeah. You're not going to be able to see this very well. But okay, it's in this, Arabic, yeah. Ancient yeah, this Arabic. Is Arabic. Okay, okay. This is, this is the Quran. Okay. Now, this Quran is also in the cover here. And in 1972, so you think I, I pulled some wild conspiracies out of this book. Wait till you get to this one. In 1972, some German scientists were in Sana'a, Yemen, at the Grand Mosque in Sana'a, Yemen, and the custodians or the janitors of the Grand Mosque were throwing out some old documents and parchments. And so the scientists said, oh, well, let's look at these and, and study these. 
and they came across this one. And all this is, you know, you can find this on the internet. There have been some studies. So I'm not like unveiling secret information. I'm just, this is kind of obscure information. So they found this, this parchment here. Or okay. the, word is, the word is actually palimpsest, a word I'd never heard of until I was doing my research for Messianic Reveal. But I came across uh, a study on this palimpsest. And palimpsest main, basically means repurposed parchment or document. So in the old days, because paper was such a premium, when you wrote things down, if you had a typo or if you needed to update something, you just rubbed out the old stuff and wrote over, you know, because paper was, you know, until the Chinese taught the Middle East and then later the Europe how to use paper, you know, it was, it was a precious commodity. So these German scientists found this in 1972, and they said, this is the Quran. But then if you look, and if, you, if people will buy my book, they'll see in the picture there are markings under that. And that's what the German scientists wanted to study, uh, the markings between the lines. And, and as they looked at, looked at that, they realized that that was also the Quran. And, but they dated it. And they looked at the date of that Quranic writing. And they believed, they purported, they assessed, they asserted, I'm using correct, uh, precise verbs here, that the Quran in the older uh, document, parchment, palimpsest, predated Muhammad. Now, I'm not looking to agitate or provoke or, or create controversy. This is true. Gerard Pirin, a uh, German scientist, purported that. Now, of course, he was quickly disinvited from Yemen, and he went back to Germany, and he never got to really finish his study, a proper study on that, because uh, it was highly sensitive and, frankly, incendiary. But does that not present some like mind-blowing thoughts in your mind? Like, wait, wait, could there be a written Quran that predates the time of Muhammad, because that, again, challenges some of the premise to the belief system of one and a half billion people in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> but, it's, but it's it makes for a great universal. thriller. Yeah. It makes for a great thriller, because I can tie that to the stolen archives in Kuwait in 1990 by the Iraqi looters. They went, and, you know, these archives have never been accounted for, not all of them. Uh, okay. And then he can take you up the Tigris River, up to Baghdad, to 1258, you know, figuratively, historically, and literally, you know, up to Baghdad. When the Mongols came across from Asia, and po possibly, perhaps with some collusion by the declining Persian Empire and the, the ascendant European Crusaders, they created the corridor for these Mongols to come in and just wipe out the most enlightened and wealthiest city on the planet, like a nuclear bomb hitting New York or, or London. And uh, all that ties in with some some amazing discoveries and a little bit of a treasure hunt. I wonder if you'd be able to sell this in the Middle East. I mean, <laughs> are these available in, in bookshops in the Middle East? With I don't know yet. Uh, the bottom line is, if you take it at at a face value, and plus these are new. This one only came out a few months ago. If you take it at face value, you're going to say, oh, this guy is writing an expose on faith. No, these are political historical thrillers, and I've had both books um, looked at by uh, Muslim colleagues who who would would flag for anything controversial. They but they come back and say, "Wow, you taught me some things about my own faith that I didn't know." Um, okay. Because because I treat the belief system of people with great respect. Uh, I'm not looking to say, I'm not looking to poke my finger in. In the eye of of the you know of religious belief, I'm actually pointing out um, some historical truths or historical perceptions that have have you know kind of lingered through the years, and and how you have politically motivated spoilers who go in and kind of dabble and meddle and and exploit and pull pull on the belief on the emotional systems of people to for their own political gain. Okay, this is this is fascinating. I'm I'm gonna just switch gears now and I'm, I'm going to ask you about your publishing journey because part of this podcast is we help authors aspiring authors as as they publish but i i noticed something interesting that's the journalist in me your publisher is james morgan right uh, morgan, morgan james sorry morgan james fiction and my understanding that's the christian publisher um is is that correct or they 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 publish christian fiction and i was i'm wondering if like how you found them or the interest is cause religion or would that even cause another controversy that's a Christian publisher published a book about Islam. So 
I'm just well, just curious. Well, I, I have to correct you. It's not a book about Islam. It's a book about okay. historical events in 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 a political and religious setting. So, okay. Um, okay. So I have to slightly tweak that a little bit, but um. Sure, I, sure, yeah. I do. I believe that the Morgan James does mostly Christian publishing. Uh, they don't do much fiction. So the work they do is like self help and life coaching and yeah. uh, and uh, uh, things like that. Um, and uh, and I worked with him because I actually wrote Messianic Reveal overseas, and I had no idea how to publish it. And so uh, through um, uh, actually, uh, you know, and and I think you know, publishing is really hard these days. Wow. And yeah. uh, and like even finding an editor, especially when you're overseas, I knew nothing about this. I knew how to write. Yeah. I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to get you know, get an editor. I didn't know how to find a publisher. Um, but I just happened to have had a, a brother who had been published, uh, and he'd worked with uh. this company and this publishing firm, and he introduced me to the CEO. And, uh, and when, you know, and I have to say some of the topic, the subject matter, uh, was a little bit concerning up front, but then I had a conversation very much like this mm. with Morgan James people, and, and, uh, again, they, they only publish like 12 to 15 fictions a year. They don't do that yeah. much. It does not have to be Christian. Um, and, um, because I know that they do some, uh, science fiction, um, yeah, but, um, but, uh, but it does have to be clean. It has, the, you know, they, they, um, have, oh. so they, they have very strict standards on, you know, if you, know, you can't have foul language, you can't have, you know, gratuitous uh, sex or violence or anything like that. My books do cross over. There's some violence in my books. But but somehow I was able to kind of keep that within um, you know the standards. I bring in some military uh, characters and and I don't use a foul or profane language myself. But you know to to give the real character of some of the military characters, uh, there there was some deb- debating and negotiating. Um, yeah. But you know we had to keep the language like PG. Uh, so so a little bit of a, a challenge with that. Um, but also when they uh, when the publishing company and I do believe that they. They are notionally or nominally a Christian publishing company. When they saw the respect I had and the empathy I have, and and frankly the compassion and love I have for the people in the Middle East, um, there was really no question about it. They, this is a book that they wanted to get behind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason honestly I know about them is because I interviewed another author who was published by them, and uh, so that's 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 why I know. And I was I was curious because you know military guys are like you know they they usually use foul language <laughs> and we we hear that you know in in movies and in books so I was I was kind of surprised why those guys <laughs> never cussed in the book but not, now I understand but it, it makes sense I mean that's that's the publisher's uh, request so I I can you know which is good so my kids can read that which is which is nice. Yeah, it, 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 there, there is some violence, especially there's more violence in the second book. You know, okay. but, hey, I was in the military. I'm a veteran myself. I okay. got through without using a lot of uh, foul language. So, so you don't have to write military guys uh, to be crude and obscene, um, you know, uh, and, and full of uh, profanity. So that was not a hard struggle for me. But I, okay. didn't want to, I did want to write them because I've been around a lot of special forces uh, guys. Some of these guys are just complete. Well, I don't want to say whack jobs. I mean, some of them, uh, you know, <laughs> they are they operate in a different sphere than the rest of us mere mortals. And I, and I did want to capture some of the zaniness that they yeah. have. And and and, and I I brought in material that's been screened and vetted by by some people in the Green Berets, for example. Like, I, you know, I want this. These books have to be authentic. They have. Yeah. To, that's why I love that you fact check me. I have others fact check me because I want this to be a hundred percent authentic. Because yeah. what I'm presuming, the storyline is absolutely insane. <laughs> I would say the true parts are terrifying. So uh, I, I need to match the, the, the terrifying truths with equal kind of zaniness and, and, uh, and sin, uh, you know, I, I don't know, just thought-provoking storylines. Yeah, I also noticed from my research, I think there's a documentary about it, about the siege of Mecca. I think this uh, Ukrainian born Italian journalist wrote something about it a few years ago and I think there might be either a documentary in the making or there'll be a documentary uh, so I, I would check this out and 
There is a yeah. wonderful book that I read that um, taught me a lot about this. Um, uh, is Yaroslav Trofimov or something like that? Is his name? I, but uh, he wrote a wonderful book called The Seeds of Mecca. Uh, that yeah, this one. Yeah. 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 Very, yeah. I very think that I think they're book. turning it into uh, a movie or something like this. Um, oh. Uh, or a documentary or. I, <laughs> I know, I know. So I was wondering if there's like some sort of a collaboration. Um, but anyways, so so if you go back to the to the publishing journey, so you you didn't you don't have an agent. You went traditionally with like uh, directly with this with a small press, and you mm. skipped the agent part. Yeah. Why haven't you considered self publishing? Uh, versus a small press because self publishing you have, you know the independence to use whatever you want to the adikas words you want to include whatever. So why why didn't you go through this route? Just curious. Well, to to be honest with you, um, uh, I have a day job and it keeps me very very busy. Um, I okay. work quite a bit and uh, and and plus as again as I wrote both of these books, I was overseas. I didn't know how, and I didn't have the time to go and research. And uh, and and frankly, there was kind of I, I had a lucky break having a brotherhood published with uh, a, a a small independent publishing firm. Uh, you know, having access to that, it kind of you know that worked in my favor. So, did I ever consider um, independent or going completely um, self-publishing? Not really, because I think I was just too intimidated. I like. Okay. I didn't want to publish to publish. I wanted to publish to tell a story that no one has has really ever covered. That, that that's why. So my passion. It's not about the money. It's not about the um, uh, you know, the fame, which you know, so far has not come. <laughs> Neither has. That's fine. I am passionate about these stories and the, these encounters. So um, so that's why it it never occurred to me to try to self publish because I'm not looking just to oh I'm published. I'm looking to share a story that um, is uh, incredibly unique and authentic. Yeah. So you say you have a day job. So what's your writing routine is? And that's one. Like, how, when do you have the time to, um, you know, I think you have a family as well. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. when do you, how can you balance all of that? And also, you're pretty active on social media and you have a very nice website. And so... How do you do all this marketing and the job and the writing? I'm just curious how you manage your time and what's what's your routine like? Well, um, I'll, in two phases. One, when I wrote Messianic Reveals, and I, frankly, I can't go into a lot of the details, but I was probably the busiest I'd ever been. Um, okay. I, you know, working late through the night, I had a lot of uh, very dynamic engagement going on with work. Um, but but um, but the work challenged me, stimulated my mind and thinking. And so I, I had extra energy, and I started writing. Actually, it's really not writing. I was compiling. And, and then lo and behold, the more I compiled, the more a narrative just appeared. And I was so kind of excited about that when I finished that. Like, I didn't know how to finish it, but one of my sons said, don't finish it. Leave it as a cliffhanger. It was like, okay, <laughs> which was a brilliant <laughs> idea. So then I launched right into this one, and this one, it just wrote itself. Six months later, boom, I had it okay. done. Uh, so it was like, how did you find the time? Well, when my son uh, was studying, then I would be writing. So if, he, mm. if he's carving out time to study, then I'm going to carve out time to write. I get up early on the weekends. Um, I didn't have this this set time. You know, so some some great authors out there. This is their 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 vocation. They write mm. and they set aside four hours a day and they're very disciplined. No, I would sneak out. You know, uh, thirty minutes here, or forty five minutes here, or maybe two hours here, and you know, I'd just kind of grab it when I could. And, um, and, and write because, you know, I just needed to ex drain my brain from, you know, all these thoughts were swirling. And, and I find that I can do that on a keyboard pretty well. But when it came to the, you know, starting with the third book, again, it's just writing itself. You know, if you're not marketing, you're not writing. So, so that's when I started, uh, and working with my, my publishing company, they were very helpful in helping me to like know what markets to target and how to get engaged and how to load a, you know, little things on Twitter. I, I was a complete Luddite. I didn't know anything about social media, but, but I did get some good tips on building a good website and, and, uh, connecting with people. So I try to stay active, but honestly, um, that's, that's where the work is. And that's what mm -hmm. slowed me down with the, the third book is, is in draft form. The fourth book is probably about 80% done. Uh, finding time to write 
is really, really tough. Now, I have to say, you know, work, family, time to write, and marketing and pushing and doing book signings and and uh, you know, and, and in interviews. This is these are the competing interests now. So if if you're not marketing, you're not selling. If you're not uh, selling, why are you writing? You know that kind of thing. I'm writing because yeah. I love the storyline, um, but but it's hard to actually uh, balance all that. And I think that I, you know, and one of the things I love about the publishing company, Morgan James, so I spoke to the CEO David Hancock initially on. He said, "Why are you why are you trying to publish?" And you know, so it's a question I hadn't asked. I was like, and I think I. I told him what I told you, Natasha, was like, I've got a story that no one else has ever really explored in the way I've done it. And he said, good, because if you're, if you're writing become rich and famous, then you're going to be sorely disappointed because the market is, you know, full right now. I mean, you've got, it's saturated. You've got people who are writing, just throwing stuff into the market. Mm. Some of it's good, some of it's not, but it's hard to get to, you know, uh, you know, some of it, or much of it will never be seen because, you know, certain, certainly if you self-publish, how do you how do you connect to an audience? So if you're not connecting to an audience, you're not selling books. Yeah. So yeah. Those are the struggles. So those those are the struggles. Um, and I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. I'd rather be writing, <laughs> but yeah. but in order to get this story out that I feel so passionate about, you know, I I have to kind of get out of my comfort zone and and get into some technology and and get you know engage with people. Yeah. So are you done with books three and four? Are you done writing them? Or where are you in the writing process? Well, book three is done, Babylon Reveal. And Babylon Reveal, I'm really excited about. And as, okay. as a teaser, because it's not ready. It's not, it's, not, it's not even gone to edit yet. It is a political, historical thriller just in the same. It's a sequel. You have Messianic Reveal. You have Writ Reveal. Then you have Babylon Reveal. And I simply ask and answer the question, why is the city of Babylon so curse. I mean, if you think of, you know, like Babylon, I mean, it, uh, it, it is cursed in, in the three great Abrahamic faiths, in, in Judaism and Christianity and Islam. It, it bears this curse. Why? Again, it's not a religious book. It's historical discovery and, and it's fiction. Um, but I actually come up with something, and it takes me back to Iraq. And I'm so glad you, you talked to your Iraqi friend, because all yeah. three of my first three books are, are largely centered on Iraq. And you're like, why? Why Iraq? Well, we we invaded. We liberated Kuwait from Iraq, yeah. and then we liberated the Iraqi people from Saddam Hussein. You know, you can take that however you want, but but you know, we were engaged. We sent military troops. I went to Iraq. Uh, why does Iraq matter to us so much? And if you look at the history, it's, it's phenomenal. It's so rich, and it's also rich. You know, and you you got tombs to the great prophets like Ezekiel and um, uh, Jonah. You know, you got tombs to to the prophets mm. of, of all three faiths are scattered around Iraq and people still make pilgrimages to these people. And one of the things is really, and we didn't talk about it with Messianic Reveal, let me ask you, Natasha, before reading Messianic Reveal, you knew that Ayatollah Khomeini was in Paris, right? Before he went to Tehran. I think most people understood no. that. that he, I didn't, he spent no. About a year, okay. He yeah. spent about a year and a half in Paris yeah. before he went to Tehran. But almost nobody knows where he was before Paris. He was in southern Iraq in uh, Najaf and, and Karbala for about 12 years, connecting to the Shia um, uh, theocracy, the, the Shia elite. Well, is this important? Yeah, it's really important. It really matters because that's why Saddam Hussein couldn't have the guy next door in Tehran who had the religious loyalties and fealties among the majority of his own population. So mm. do you connect? Yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. Clayton of Haley course. says they connect. <laughs> I, li- I like Clayton Haley. Uh, he's a nice guy. <laughs> he's, a cool, he's a cool guy, isn't he? I, I have yeah. to say, people love Clayton <laughs> Haley. They, they yeah. love a protagonist who has imposter syndrome. He just doesn't think he's good enough to be in this position. Uh, and he's kind of stumbling through. He's a nice guy. He's not Mr. Cool, you know, stud muffin who's in charge and, you know, large and in charge. He's just an ordinary guy who just finds himself in, in extraordinary circumstances. I think he needs a girlfriend. <laughs> and in one of the books, he seems very lonely. <laughs> ah, okay. We okay, need some we're, romance. We're, <laughs> Natasha, you're going okay. to love this. He okay. finds a girlfriend in okay. book two, and okay. she's, she's Jordanian-American. 
Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. No, I really have to read the second one. Okay. Her name, her name is actually Jordan Cooper. So she, she's named for the country because her mom ah. is from Jordan. And she's also a diplomat, and, and they meet in Kuwait. So, yes, he finds a girlfriend. Oh, wow. Well, good for him. <laughs> good for well, you, Haley. I, <laughs> I have to say, I, I have to say <laughs> my wife, because people die in my books, and my wife, when she read about <laughs> Jordan Cooper for the first time, she said, you need to kill her. <laughs> <laughs> this is not me. This is Clayton <laughs> Haley. He's a young man, and, and she's a beautiful woman, and he falls in love. Well, you need to kill her. But I have to say, She's grown to, uh, she, she likes Jordan Cooper and she likes how, and coming back to one of the criticism of, of my, my book, it is a fair question. Yeah. Uh, this book at times doesn't read like a novel because, you know, it's my first novel. I, uh, you know, it's a great story, but, you know, it, in some places it's not as smooth as it should be, you know, like character development. I'm still, you know, that's my first one. This one, I, I, I get it. I get it. Okay. And so I build out the characters a little bit more. You get to know more about Clayton Haley and, and now Jordan Cooper. Um, so yes, he does. He does find a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's that's good to know. Uh, all right. So this this has been wonderful, Ethan. I, uh, I I I really enjoyed your book. As I said, I finished it very quickly. I mean, I, I couldn't stop reading. Who can stop reading uh, when all these uh, are going on? And I can't wait to read the second one. I want to see about that Jordanian girlfriend. Jordanian girls are, are tough. I mean, don't, don't mess with them. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, not only, yes, you're exactly right. He's a little bit nervous around her. Uh, but she also takes him uh, olive picking in Jordan in the third book and he tries Mansif for the first time. Ah, wow. Well, okay, I definitely yeah. need, need to read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the third book, though. Okay, the third book. Okay. And uh, any last words uh, you want to, uh, you know, tell the audience? Any aspiring authors, maybe um, diplomats who want to go to the Middle East? Or, you know, just something you well, want to talk about, especially someone who's interested in Middle Eastern history and... Also, Middle Eastern, let's say, uh, thrillers, if, if there's a genre <laughs> uh, called it. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I don't know if, if there is a genre out there, but I, I would say that if, you know, again, there, there, I have a lot of different audiences in mind when I write these books. If you want to understand what's behind the headlines, okay. these are great introductory books. Uh, well, not introductory. These are deep dives, um, to be honest with you. I, I get into some deep issues in these books, but I try to do it in a way that if you if you can hang on and and help, you know, uh, some of the names or you, you'll you'll get names like Abdul Razak and Muhammad and Khaled, and you'll get all these different names that are not familiar to an American audience. But hang on, get through it, and you'll find that these are great introductions to the Middle East, Middle East and 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 tour guides really to to the Middle East while having a great, great story. And I would say to writers, you know, uh, always question your motive. Why are you writing? Are you writing to become rich and famous to be an influencer? If, if that's the case, sure, fine, great, do that. But, you know, be prepared for some disappointment along the way. If you're writing out of passion or you've got a great story, then uh, then that will be very uh, gratifying and satisfying. You, you, sh you know, you should write for, you know, write from your heart. And, and that's what I've done in, with these books. And I would just say I have to make a plug. My publisher would be upset if I didn't. Uh, you can buy these books on all of your favorite online distributors. Uh, if they're not in your local bookstore, you can ask them to, to put them on the shelf, or you could just simply order them from your uh, your favorite online distributor. Um, these books will challenge you in whole different ways. And and I'd love to hear, you know, you can track me down through the Internet. I'm at Ethan Burroughs at EthanBurroughs.com. I'm on uh, social media at, e, I think, uh, E.T. Burroughs for Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I love to hear from people. I love to hear people challenge me. Like, hey, Ethan, I'm not so sure about this. Bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> uh, I, I've done my research. And and again, I will say, you know, if you're nervous about, oh, religion and politics, I say, um, read, read the books and you'll see that I treat these very deeply meaningful and emotional issues with great respect. I, I do not... Yeah target a belief. I do not target a religion. I do not target people. I do target the exploitation of belief by the by the, the power elite, the people who would use 
and manipulate people for their own advantage. And I'm not a hypocrite. And you'll see that I, I as you follow the, the evolution of the reveal series, you'll see that um, I, I, I address that in, across different faiths. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a great book. So thank you very much, uh, Ethan. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and uh, for another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. And until we meet again. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you.